Whenever you're ready, sir, would you please tell me the correct way to pronounce your client's name? Toda. Toda? Okay. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> hey, my name is Scott Knox. Mr. And with friends, I'd like to reserve uh, three minutes for a bottle. Yeah. Okay. You know, know that this is a case that involves a dispute between two neighbors uh, and whether or not uh, one neighbor can have access to the water that has uh, been purchased by the other neighbor. And my client is the Totas. They, uh, I think the facts in this case are probably very, very important because uh, one of the issues that's going to be raised is... Uh, Your clients own the... the um land beneath the lake, correct? Correct. Okay, and their position is we don't, because we own the land beneath the water, we don't have to let anyone use the water. Our position is because the lake is man-made, that's correct. Oh, I thought it had something to do with navigability. It also has to do with that. There's two issues involved. One well, I think from the record, like going back into the 1800s, there's pictures of this lake in existence. And it looks like, and I think the trial court found that, yeah, it started out, it was a natural lake, but it looked like because of the shape that it had been altered. Correct. So does that take it out of the, does that put it in the category of man-made, or is it still a naturally occurring body of water? Well, it, the, I don't think there's any dispute there was a pond there sometime in the past, whenever that, uh, I think there was evidence presented in the form of documents like maps and they go back to the 1900s and the 1800s. It showed a small white, or small uh, blue lake, what they call a lake. But, I think if you looked at uh, Exhibit A now, which is the uh, picture of 1926, you see that the lake was just, a, and, the, and the expert witness testified that that lake was just a shallow pond that was surrounded by a well. Well, you know, in, in looking at the, the picture that's in the record with the, the white line showing the border of the, the property your client owns, um, how is any any of the homeowners around the shore of that lake supposed to know when they crossed over into your client's part of the lake? Well, there's some obvious things that they should know, which is that the spoil island off of the coast, if you will, off of the coast of the peninsula, is part of the lake, and that is part, and the court even found that that was part of Toda's ownership. So clearly, they shouldn't be going around the lake. If, if it, at that point in time. They also know that they own, in this case, the fevers only own one acre of the lake. And they know that if you go to the uh, spoil island, you're, you're exceeding where your boundary line is. There's okay. no specific the boundary line. Find that, that you, you could keep people off the spoil island, you just couldn't keep them from using the lake. I'm if, sorry. I didn't didn't the trial court find that your clients could prohibit people from you going on the spoil island but could not prohibit um, the other owners from using the water in the lake. Yeah, that's what the court found. But the yeah. court's finding was in opposition to Anderson versus Bell, which has the, virtually the same facts, where it said that the privately owned portion of the lake is exclusive. Well, the, the problem I see with Anderson versus Bell is we don't know whether your clients are Anderson or if they're Bell. Because we don't know if the, the artificial, to the extent the lake was altered, is that what created the island that your clients had their little home on? Yes. And therefore that's what gave them access to the water? Or is that what originally gave the other residents access to the water? So we don't know which is which, do we? Oh, I don't know that you know which is which, but I don't think it makes any difference though. Because there's a deed that came out from Mr. Tooks, which is the name of the lake, Tooks Lake back in 1960 that describes my client's property, 9.8 acres. And that deed has been passed down through a by, I think, three other different owners. And he paid $16,000 for it, so he's got some investment in it. And somewhere in the past, somebody built that peninsula, somebody built that home on the, on the peninsula. 
And that peninsula was not there if you look at the first 1926 uh, photo. It may have been a natural lake at that time, but it's not now because it's been improved. Right, so nobody living on that peninsula would have had the benefit of the use of the lake because there was no peninsula at that time. I'm sorry, can you repeat that one? The people living on the peninsula wouldn't have had the benefit of the use of the lake because there was no peninsula. That's just just as the uh, defendant and Andrea, just as Bell, I think, wouldn't have the benefit of using the creek if Anderson hadn't made all of those improvements. Correct. And so your clients, again, they may be Bell as opposed to Anderson. I think my client is Anderson because well, even though the, he didn't, thing, they didn't perform the, the, the actual improvements to the lake. I would agree with that. And I don't think anybody can, can establish when or how that happened. We know it was there in 1968. We know it was not there in, two, in 1926. All you have to do is to compare the two photos. So those two at the time period, you know, that's, it happened sometime between 26 and, and 68. But the fact of the matter is, if you look at the Anderson case, the real gist of that case was there's an investment in MACT expectation by the part of the developer, which would be somebody in, up in 1968, for example, that the value of the property goes up. And that value continues to go with the property because it was improved. My but point if we is- find, But if we find that as the trial court did, that this is not a man-made lake, then we would affirm, correct? No. And I'll tell you why. Again, this goes back to the case that the, uh, was cited by the Supreme Court in the Anderson case. They cited to Kaiser versus Aetna, which is a federal Supreme Court case, dealing with a natural lagoon that existed that was improved by a developer and was that was deemed to be exclusive and, and private. As it was, that was what the Supreme Court held. You couldn't have access to it. If it, unless you had the permission of the owner. And that's the same case we have here. But, but in the Kaiser case, and maybe I'm confusing it with another case, wasn't the entire body of water located on one tract of property? At one time it was. You, you're talking about the, uh, the uh, Kaiser case? Or are you talking about the... Uh, maybe I'm thinking of a different case, but I, I, the, the cases you cited, I remember being distinguishable, but I can't remember whether I'm confusing it with, with one of the other ones that you were relying on. So, I'll go back and double-check that. Okay. Well, I think we're relying on Anderson. And, and Anderson involved a case where they took a natural creek, expanded it to a lake, and became a private lake. He apparently sold off a piece of, uh, one acre piece of it to, to Bell, and Bell tried to fish on the other part of it. Well, and that's what brought the problem. To, uh, in, into a lawsuit, and the court held because Anderson had improved the lake. He says sell or not sell, or let people have access to the, his property or not. It's true like property, and that's that's what the. If you go back to 1883, when this property was first transferred from the state to a private owner, it was part of a four million acre purchase. So that lake was his, and he owned it. The whole lake, or just a portion? The whole lake, because back in 1883, four million acres included the lake. Off. It's only a 12-acre lake. And, and because, of it, if you look at the, the, the Triple League case that I cited in my brief, where the Supreme Court said, if you, if you own a private lake in its totality, you can do anything you want to in terms of selling it like any other real estate. And if you parcel it off, do, you, do they lose their literal rights? Yes. The answer is yes, because why? Because they're the majority owner. Because somebody has improved the, the lake at one point, they put money into it. That money is valued to them. They had a so what? So then, what? If it's the money, if it's value to you, why would you sell the property and say to people, "Oh, but I'm selling you this property, so you can only use this little part of the lake." To me, that would seem absolutely contrary to say they improved the property and therefore want to derive economic value from it because the, obviously those those smaller properties will be less valuable because the access to the lake is much more limited. That's true. By that. But, so that's completely contrary but, to the 
the person who builds the land, builds the peninsula, put his house on it, is the person that is involved with selling off all the property. How so, do we how do we reconcile Duval versus Thomas, which is our case? Duval involved a natural way where somebody put try to put up a berm and they can get taken out. An argument here: this is a natural lake, although there have been some modifications to it. Well. The, I think the difference is, well, in our case, we have a man-made lake, at least a man-old lake. You would agree it was natural in the beginning. So you're saying it changed its state. Right. And people put money we, to, to do that. And that, and that value gets transferred down the line. To, and the best case you have on that, that a natural lake can be changed into a man-made lake is what? Kaiser versus... Is Kaiser. Yes. The lagoon. Yes. That was an actual situation, which was trans translated or transferred into a developed situation. And because of that, it was going to be private. That's the same situation we have here. It doesn't make any difference if you bought a condo on property later, you still had to have access to the lake only if you were, had permission of the developer who did it, which I'm sure it might be the way it would be, but that wasn't done in this case. There's no evidence here that anybody other than the totas received this 9.8 acres of, of land. It, it goes back to 1960, as I said, originally when it was uh, transferred to private property, uh, to private owners uh, by Mr. Tukes, who was the namesake of the lake. So it's our consider, it's our belief that Anderson versus L is the case that controls this situation. It's also the issue of navigability. When the judge decided this case was, uh, this lake is not navigable, it was uh, basically, I think, a death knell for the uh, claim there's any littoral or riparian rights on the part of other owners. Well, no, I mean, it's, it's the death knell for any riparian or littoral rights on the part of the public. That's, well, it should be, the right, right here. These are, these are private property owners who own property adjacent to the water. So they're very different from just the public, right? Well, we're not talking about the public. We're talking about adjacent owners. Right. Okay. They don't, they, they don't have riparian rights to a, let me read the, the paragraph I'm worried about, concerned about. The, the, first, the judge determined that chapter 253 applied in this case, and he applied this parent two of that statute. He does not apply a parent one. Friend one reads, riparian rights are those incident to land bordering upon navigable waters. That includes all navigable waters and includes all, uh, all land. So if you own land abutting a navigable water, you have riparian rights, or you have, it depends if it's what kind of water body it might be. But riparian rights, the way the legislature put together, it seems to be both riparian and littoral, because they changed that law in 1985 to reflect just that riparian rights are those on navigable waters only. So when the judge says the lake is not navigable, there is no riparian right, which means there's no littoral right, which means, and that was the basis for his decision, that there was littoral rights. And there aren't any under that statute because it applies to both Littoral and riparian rights. The, the difference between littoral and riparian is riparian is, is the is the nature of the water body. But riparian rights refers to rivers and streams and those kinds of things. Littoral rights refers to lakes. Correct. Nobody it has nothing to do with navigable or non navigable. It does. It's the, it's the, the nature of the body of water. You don't disagree, Your Honor, because the case law, even from this district, is that. You only have the plural on that or riparian rights if you abut navigable water. That's that's we have the brand case I saw in the in the case from the fourth district. This but under the statute. And under the statute too. But the statute doesn't apply here. I think that's the whole point of the trial was that the statute by its plain language applies to state lands and riparian rights uh, are those that in, are into land working on navigable waters. That doesn't mean that there is no such thing as riparian rights on navigable waters. But you're saying that this statute implicitly overrules Duval. 
That's what I'm saying. I'm saying the statute incorporates both, like littoral and telegraphian rights, because the case law does that. The case law says they're interchangeable, they're the same thing. And the statute came out after that case law saying they're the same thing. So when the legislature says that riparian rights attach to land that abuts navigable waters, it's all navigable waters and it's all land. It doesn't distinguish between streams and oceans or streams and lakes. It's all navigable water. So are you saying lakes aren't navigable? Pardon me? Are you, are you saying that lakes aren't navigable? I mean, to no, me, I'm saying this. Sort of these no, 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 no. I'm saying, I'm saying this lake, judge determined this lake is not navigable. Right. So oh, we are so not right. under this statute. Yeah, right. That's correct. They're not under that. That provision says that they don't have littoral rights, and his decision was based on littoral rights. There is no littoral rights under that statute. They're, they're mixed, merged together. So you have to have navigable waters. If you don't have navigable waters, you don't have those rights. It's a private lake. It can be disposed of in any way that the developer wants to do it or anybody that owns it wants to do it. And that's what happened throughout the uh, time period between 1960, somewhere between 1983 and, and 1968. That's what happened. If they, they divided the land up, and you know, they gave everybody a piece of the lake, but they gave 9.8 acres to uh, Mr. Tooks, gave 9.8 acres to his successor, and was passed down the line to other successors. And my client ended up with property and spent $16,000 on it. And the ethnic uh, concert case basically says, you know, once you invest money in the property, which is in this case sixteen thousand dollars, he paid his premium to get the nine point eight acres. No, it's when it's when you invest the money to modify the property, isn't it? That's well, the situation in Anderson versus Bell. But I think the, yes, that's true. But the modification carries forward. It doesn't the value carries forward, and he's and my client paid extra money to get that's his investment. He's got an investment in that same 9.8 acres. It'd be, it would be like uh, the Kaiser case, the owner transferring property, uh, a portion of the lagoon to somebody and it had to pay $20,000 for it. That's their part of the lagoon. Or it, could be, could be out. Or it could be like Bell selling his property to the next guy and saying, yeah, sure, you can use that water. Well, it could be if the, if the a private owner who owned the lake had the right to say that, which is not the case in the Bell case, because there was an improved lake. It's an improved piece of property. It's, a, it's an improved lake. It's not a, a, in its original state. And that makes a difference under the case law. Sir, you're at 17. Okay, I will sit down. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Morning, Your Honors. Uh, for the first first of the finding of the facts, okay, the Honorable uh, Judge Andrews heard all the expert witness testimony. He reviewed all the evidence in the man -made, and had made his decision. Okay, and I quote, uh, I'm sorry, Tooks Lake is a natural body of water. It was a two-day trial. We had expert witnesses. They had expert witnesses. We had exhibits. And Judge Andrews stated in his decision, and I quote, to the court's satisfaction, the question has been answered with room to spare. So I'm, not, I'm sure that finding of fact that the Tooks Lake is a natural lake, that should stand. It is a natural lake. It's been there since the earliest map we could find was in the early 1800s. In regards to the literal rights, <clears throat> excuse me, Judge Andrews indicated that the literal rights are common law rights. And the opposing attorney cites a statute where he interprets, where he says the state has intended to use riparian and literal rights interchangeable. However, the flaw with that, with that statute that he's mentioning, never mentions literal rights at all. It doesn't, it's not there, okay? So the opposing attorney would like this court to believe that the state legislator took away property owners' rights, or their literal rights <clears throat> to water without even using the term. I mean, if it would seem from a non-lawyer uh, as myself that if the state of Florida wanted to take away a right of property owners, such as literal rights, 
they would have expressly and very deliberately stated that, which they did not. You got riparian rights and literal rights are two different things. So that type of, inter if, if you interpret it as the opposing side uh, wants to interpret it, there basically wouldn't be literal rights if it's not a navigable body of water. There's no such thing as literal rights because it would wipe it out. So based on that, uh, I believe that Judge Andrews' decision to stand. And uh, unless the court has any other questions, I rest on my brief. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I believe the issue of whether it's uh, riparian is in dispute, I mean, whether it was natural is in dispute. I think the evidence did show that it was natural when it was originally a small pond in the middle of the wetland. <clears throat> I don't think that's what happened subsequently. There's been an improvement in the lake. We have unrebutted, unrebutted testimony from the expert witness that the judge recognized as an expert that said it was improved. It was improved with, with uh, it was dredged. It was improved with the fill that was taken from the dredging to make the peninsula, and it was improved to, to create a spoil island from the And dredging. you're saying the modifications can extinguish someone's prior littoral rights by their dredging? By, I'm sorry. Uh, did, did I just hear you say that if someone owns part of the lake, which although it's the majority of the lake um, on the diagram, that other folks who had littoral rights, that by their dredging they can extinguish other common law littoral rights? No, I'm not saying that. Okay. I'm saying that because it was improved. There were no littoral rights to begin with under the statute because but, the statute. But it's not the whole entire lake. Well, the, it's not now, but it was back in 1883. And, it's, and basically, what the court in uh, the Triple E case said was that if you own the entire lake, you can just you can do whatever you want with it in terms of selling it. You can treat it like a, a piece you of property. You the entire lake. I might agree with you. Yeah. Well, and that, that's what happened because it's been passed down that way. That's what. Tooks in 1960 passed down 9.8 acres to somebody else who passed it down to somebody else who passed it down to somebody else who got, gave it to my client. And my client paid $16,000 for it. For the, for the submerged land under the surface of the water. That's correct. Submerged land. But, but if you look at the deed so that my client. Dock. They, they own the land, they can build a dock. They own the land and the water according to the. It, according to the Anderson case, okay? But in my, in my client's case, he paid the $16,000 and he has made it clear that he doesn't want other people to use it. And uh, that property has been divided in a way that 9.8 acres have been reserved for one per, for one piece of property. And Mr. Case is still a feeder. He's got one acre of it. And there's others who have the other kinds of acres and maybe two or three acres. But the point being, they were divided. And when you have a piece of property that was originally owned by that one person back in 1883, the case in, in uh, the Triple uh, E case says that, that can be divided any way they want to. And it's been that way. Somewhere, somebody divided that way. And, that's, and this is what we have today. And because it was privately owned back in 1883, it, it's privately, it's treated like other real property. All right, thank you, sir. Thank you. Appreciate your arguments, both of you. And that concludes our docket for today. All rise. Thank you. Drive safely.